thanks everybody for coming. The, the room is uh, pretty much packed and I think online we have a good uh, attendance as well. Um, tonight, uh, we have an interesting topic, archeology span and ethnobotany. Uh, Susan Reynolds will be speaking um, to us uh, on this topic. And uh, before I begin, um, I wanted to ask Beth Irwin to come up. She has a little announcement of a very exciting uh, project that the city of Georgetown has invited us. You have to come around this way, Beth. Um, so you could be on television here. Oh, yes. That's invited us to participate in. So Beth, you wanna? Hey, the city of Georgetown capped off their old landfill X number of years ago. I don't know how many. Uh, it's on the banks of the San Gabriel River. Um, near San Gabriel Park, if you're familiar with Georgetown at all, and they would like to develop a prairie on the site. And with the Ashley, the motor of plant rescue going on, trying to save prairie plants, this would be an ideal place for those prairie plants to go. So first day of planting is nine o'clock Saturday morning where we also have a plant rescue going on and we have a field trip that day. I realize that there is a large group of non-native plant volunteers already coming that know nothing about plants. And I have the plants and I will be there and I will be supervising that. Uh, this is through the Environmental Services Department of the city of Georgetown. The 18th? Or the 11th? Tomorrow? I mean, Saturday morning at nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> this is a city this is city property with gates etc cetera, etc cetera, and people who don't work on weekends so it would be really nice if we could develop a crew and it you do not have to be a NIPSOT member to do this and you do not have to be 18 or over to do this so if you have high school students who might be interested in it because the native plant rescue project is generating volume of plants that needs home need homes weekly. It would be nice if we could get a core group that would be able to plant on a weekday. It would be better working with the city, help them out. They like to have their weekends off too. And uh, I've got a spiral notebook back there beside the free plants. So please, if you're interested, sign up. Would you please give me your name and your email? And and I'm hoping to just get a group that's willing to go out there early on weekday mornings as the summer progresses. They, in turn, have got the equipment to water it, to flag it, and so forth. And they're going to take care of that. It's just for us to put them in the ground. So, thank you. Oh, thanks, Beth. We're, <clears throat> we will also um, put out a uh, request on the blog or if you're um, not here in person, another reason why it's good to come in person, because then you can sign up. Uh, you can actually use our contact form and say that you're interested, and then we'll put you on the list. So if anyone who's out there you know, is interested in doing this, you can sign up that way, and we'll get you to the right place of uh, where you need to be in order to participate in it. But very exciting, and I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, like about 40 acres, right? Yeah, so it's not like it's two or three acres in the back. This is a big property. So this project will be continuing um, for a long time. So I think that that's, that's pretty neat. Um, and just as a side note, so how did we find out about this? <laughs> we were doing a tabling event for the Georgetown um, Conservation Summit. And at that, time, and at that uh, summit, there was a representative um, who was involved in it and then approached us and then we in turn met with the person who's directing this. Um, so it just goes to show that when you volunteer and, and we do these outreach and education events, one thing leads to another and, and that's how we make our connections. So um, kind of very interesting how this came to be. Uh, upcoming programs, um, June 
We're going to have All About Seeds. Um, it is in the Round Rock Public Library, so just keep note of that. I know we're flipping around to different places. Um, the library is very busy and they're gonna be doing some renovation work again on the rooms. So um, we're not always in the same place. So please just pay attention on the, uh, the blog and things of that nature. This is an in-person meeting only. This is a follow-up to a lecture that we had in the fall. It'll be a lot of hands-on. So it really doesn't lend itself to be a Zoom. So that's why we're making this an in-person only meeting. Um, we have the announcement of our elected officers coming in July. Um, Casey Williams is going to be speaking about native aquatic plants and uh, Ashley Landry will be uh, talking about the rediscovering of the Mocan Prairie, which is another prairie that's in our local area um, with development. So that'll be a very interesting talk, a lot of hist historical information um, with that. If you have any suggestions, you've heard a good speaker, a topic you want to know, um, just use our contact form, put it in, and uh, and Susie Hickman will uh, follow up and, and see if uh, we can accommodate the speaker coming up. Very busy time for NIPSOT, Wilco, this year. Uh, we had a field trip, again, survey number 10 at Hidden Springs. Um, some of the highlights that you see here. Uh, and it's they're very, very, you know, interesting um, surveys because as they've been doing them, they hit all four seasons. So you have all different types of blooms and uh, different types of, uh, uh, I guess, life cycles of the plants. So this was very well attended. And there's more information on the blog about the uh, survey if you want to know more about it. Uh, field trip committee, very active committee, still looking for a chair on that. Um, Great group. Um, if you're interested, you should, you know, again, send us a contact form and we'll connect you. Um, Museo Benini and the Middleton Ranch was uh, on April 27th. Um, it was a quite, you know, interesting field trip, which mi mixed uh, art and native plants. Um, two places with a lunch in between. And uh, it was a great day. And as you see, everybody was out. Um, hiking and, and looking at the different plants and identifying some very interesting ones. Upcoming field trips, um, Russell Park this Saturday um, from 8.30 to 11. Uh, this is gonna be more of a kind of, I don't wanna say moderate hike, but not the easy hikes that are usually there. So um, go to the blog and you'll see exactly um, where it is and, and the difficulty, et cetera. Um, Critchfield Conservation Preserve is May 18th. Um, we have another tree walk in Old Settlers Park. Again, as I said, each season brings a different um, part of the plant uh, life cycle. So even though it's the same place, the walks are very different. Uh, University of Texas, uh, Bill Turner Plant Resources Center or the herbarium. There's a limit of 20 participants. This will be July 20th. We will have a sign-up sheet with that. So if you're really interested in that, you'll have to look for the blog announcement and then uh, sign up from there. And then we have a couple of our other uh, surveys. My mistake, it should have been number 12. We don't do the same one twice. <laughs> um, so I did look over my PowerPoint, but I missed that one. So. I'm sorry about that. Just too much going on. So another thing, I don't know if you noticed our blog, but we had a blog post um, announcing uh, the uh, Round Rock High School Native Plant Sale, <clears throat> which was last weekend. So for those of you who don't know um, about the Round Rock High School Native Plant or Plant Club, uh, we've been working with them for several years now. Um, they have been volunteering at our spring and fall plant sales. This is a group of young people who are extremely interested in native plants, and they've been working um, with Mark Stotzer, our treasurer, uh, who is their faculty member at the high school, um, to actually propagate um, grow, sell, and and this is their first uh, plant sale. And basically it's sold out. And I think this is the whole idea of the future generation. And when you're looking at a STEM project, this is perfect. You know, you're mixing the science of botany, 
back into, you know, financial analysis and business to say, what can we do to, you know, sustain ourselves and, and bring back? And uh, they have some great, uh, they have a monarch, uh, 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 bring back the monarch grant, and they have a monarch uh, garden there. And it's a really interesting place if you're ever in the, the area to kind of go and see. So uh, kudos to them and the next generation of people uh, who will be handling our plant sales. So maybe next spring we'll all take a breather and we'll just let them do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, community outreach events. Um, we had a lot of those. They're a lot of fun. As I said, you never know who you're going to meet and what projects come from there. So this was um, at the, uh, the Family Nature Fest. That was in Gary Park. Uh, we had another one April 20th, and that was in Round Rock. Um, this was their Earth Day celebration, and we had volunteers that were out there in Round Rock. All of them are very well attended, a lot of interest, especially now in native plants. And it doesn't matter what your expertise is in native plants, whether you're a newbie or an expert, um, you can volunteer, and there's always someone there who can help. And, and there's a lot of resource and guidance, but it's, they're all a lot of fun events. Now, uh, plant rescue update. For those of you um, who haven't seen it, um, I think the next thing that Ashley's going to do is be on the cover of uh, maybe Time, <laughs> <laughs> Woman of the Year, or you know, People's 100 uh, Plant Rescue, but she's getting a lot of press. Um, from Central Texas Gardener now to the uh, featured article um, on the cover of, of this, uh, this current month's recorders at Wildflower Magazine. And I just wanted to give people like an update. So far in 2024, um, 23 plant rescues have occurred. And, you know, when you look at viability of what you're out there digging up and then, you know, saving it, and this is an arduous process because some of the plants I need to go in refrigerators, um, you know, I kept cool and this and that. So it's not just transplant and, you know, hand it out. There's a lot, once you dig it up, a lot of care that goes into it. So the fact that 70% of which rescues survive is a very, very high rate. So, you know, kudos to um, Ashley Landry and her crew of volunteers. You'll see on the blog um, when there's a plant rescue, if you're interested in uh, signing up. So if you really are interested, it's, it's kind of like, I don't know, uh, signing in for the uh, Southwest. If you want to get like on the plane, you got to like get as soon as it's there, get there 24 hours to the minute. Otherwise, you know, you're on D holding your, your suitcase on your lap. Right. So that's just think of that when you see these. It's just like that. If you, you want to do it. You got to hit it and, and sign up. OK, so they're very popular. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to point out, you know, our special projects, we have, you know, different uh, groups of people when we put out a uh, request for a work day of different gardens. Um, this is the uh, outcome of what happens. Uh, and the interesting thing was in the, the landfill over in Round Rock, we actually uh, wound up with some pink blue bonnets. So uh, that was kind of a, an interesting mutation that we have. But just just to show you kind of, you know, what the hard work that came in the early spring, now that we're here in later spring, you know, all these native uh, gardens and, and all these serve as a way for people to see what survives and what doesn't so that they can then um, look at, scan the QR code and, and go to uh, see, you know, what would grow for them or young people that are tending these gardens, understanding about native plants and botany, et cetera. So, uh, we also have um, things that are coming up. Uh, Beth just kind of talked talk to you a bit about the uh, current, we're looking for our, our, uh, our work crews to go in and do some planting at the landfill in Georgetown. And uh, as we have work days, if you just follow the blog, and if you haven't signed up for the blog, I think I've said blog about 40 times, <laughs> okay? So get the hint and sign up for the blog. You don't have to be a member of NIPSA, but if you sign up for the blog, then you get all of our news and events. That's our main uh, way that we communicate with uh, members and the public. Um, so another benefit, if you come in person, other than getting first signups, uh, actually the, the two plants that were given away today 
um, are listed here. And uh, for those who are here, the, the full explanation of um, where they grow, how they grow, et cetera, is in the back with the other plants. Okay, um, if you're here again in person, you get a chance to win um, a book. And and Erin will be very happy because she doesn't have to order it and have it mailed to someone. We actually have copies here mm -hmm. that you will take with you. And um, Susan has actually brought other copies of the book. So she will be selling them, I believe, from $20 um, after the meeting to the people in person if you choose and you would like to get the book. They'll be in the back corner. Um, these are our contact us where we, <clears throat> where we stay on social media. And if you need to look or follow us, this is kind of the info that we provide you. Um, always take note of the location of the meeting. Um, we, whether it's Zoom, uh, that's not an issue, but in person, we don't want you going one place and we're all meeting on the other and you're Zooming it on your phone in the parking lot of the place where you should be. <laughs> and uh, without further ado, I'd like to um, bring up uh, Susan so I can turn the, uh, the meeting over to her. So Susan Reynolds um, retired from a 30 year career as an award-winning band director in California and Texas. Um, she has always loved plants, gardening, and digging things up from the side of the road, and now serves her community as the executive director of the Texas Botanical Gardens and Native American Interpretive Center in Goldthwaite, Texas. She is the organizer, grant writer, fundraiser, and general. So uh, my name is Susan Reynolds, and I am the executive director at Texas Botanical Bar Gardens and Native American Interpretive Center. And I've been asked by a couple of people, you know, indirectly, but what qualifies you to do this thing today on these two big subjects? Well, nothing does. Nothing does. All I know is what I know. And that's really all any of us can say. I just happen to have lots of close ties with these two subjects. I am not formally trained. I am a lay person. But I think we're all going to learn some stuff and have some fun this evening. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I uh, appreciate the invite. Um, if you know Teresa Strickler, oh, yeah. yeah, she is the one that recommended me. I don't know why she did that to me. <laughs> I was always really nice to her child. <laughs> but I am a retired band director. I, I taught for 30 years. I, I got my uh, bachelor's degree from San Diego State University, and I got my master's from Auburn and a war eagle, just, you know, there you go. <laughs> and uh, I have recently become a master gardener, which means the training and the volunteers uh, hours are done and then some, but uh, I'm still learning as all of us are. So if you start throwing Latin names out at me, I may give you the side eye because I am still learning those. I'm, and I am learning them, but um, common names are what you're going to hear from me tonight. I hope you're not really uh, upset about that, but that's what we're going to do. I also write grants. I learned to write grants as a, a necessity in building our demonstration garden. And as a novice, uh, I've managed to write enough grants to get an entire water catchment system, irrigation system. So it's uh, it's really cool. We do not have city water at all connected to our um, demonstration garden because our purpose is to convince people to use native plants in their landscape not just at home but in their businesses so that you don't have to pay the lawn services all the time and a bank right next door to us just like clockwork there's this big old thing that comes in anyway and uh, so that they know that they can save on water because we're just not going to water them. That's just all there is to it. And so far we've been good. So the, pardon me, the mission of our um, entity is to provide a dynamic, interactive, lifelong learning experience while identifying, pro preserving, and showcasing the rich prehistoric and environmental aspects of rural Central Texas. Uh, we do have, uh, we, this is not Waco, so we're in the middle of nowhere. We almost have 5,000 people that are residents in our county. 
So the fact that we've got folks from 80 counties coming all over the state to visit our gardens is pretty good, no matter who you are. And 4,850 people last year were already ahead of that for this year. We partner with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department in that we had a, a three month series last year for new landowners. A lot of people are leaving Georgetown and guess where they're going? They're buying five little acres out in the middle of nowhere and thinking that's a ranch. Yeah. 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 They're buying 50 acres and thinking that's a ranch. And so they, there's a lot of willing learners and we partnered with TPWD to do that. We also partner with Texas Archaeological Society. They uh, did their field camp. They do a, a three-day training session each year. And last year it was at our facility with one of our active sites that is in the western part of our county. And of course, everybody, everybody partners with the AgriLife Extension Agency. We're working on a landscaping production with them. We actually meet next Monday to set the date. We partner with Tarleton State University, which is not University of Texas or Southwestern. So, but Tarleton has a wonderful um, agricultural department, wonderful agriculture department. Uh, one of their professors, Dr. Adam Mitchell, is assistant professor of entomology, and he came and did a bug show. It was great. He did all of these uh, things. He had little little poor little dead bugs on pins and this is what they look like but then he took us through our own garden and showed us where the evidence of the bugs were where their their uh, their cases were and what this this is a, this is a an egg for this it was really interesting uh, we also partner with our local library and museum which are within a half a block of where we are we do a lot of children's programs together including one that starts next friday is a three-week series and then later in july we'll do another three-week series called busy little bees it's kind of a mommy and me thing where the kids get out in nature and they fly around like a bird and they it's for littles but we also do um programs for older kids and get them out in nature. And they just, we just did a, a program with our elementary, our second grade, because everybody else was testing and they needed those second graders out of the building. <laughs> and, and I get that, educator, I get that. So they sent them to us and uh, we partnered with our local garden club and taught them how to plant a plant, how to pot a plant, uh, which ones don't pull that one, do pull this one. And they had the best time playing out in the dirt instead of sitting in a room having to watch videos all day. Yeah. We also have lots of professionals that come out and amateurs, really passionate amateurs. Do you guys know Ricky Lennox? Oh, oh, yeah. He's come to us three times. My That's favorite, great. yeah, he's wonderful. He literally wrote the book, right? He did his presentation on uh, cattle silage. So for native grasses and things that are nutritious and, and eat half, leave half. That was great for the ranchers in our area. But he also came, my favorite one was called Fifty Shades of Green. <laughs> Nifty natives for your uh, landscape. It was great. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. Lots of fun. We do have a unique thing in that our gardens is more than a garden. It's actually a living museum. We've had these uh, plants. We had recommendations of plants from a man named Scooter Cheatham. Are you familiar with him? Yeah. Okay. He's the one that we consulted and he advised us on which plants to plant in our garden so that we could be accurate to native plants as far back as possible. And we hit the 3000 year mark. So that's pretty good. That's a living museum. If you were here uh, on this planet 3000 years ago, then you could walk around in central Texas and that's what you would see. So all of the stuff that I'm gonna to talk to you about today is directly from information that's gathered at the garden. It has been verified and vetted by the Texas Historical Commission, which is about all, it's over all the archeology span for the state and uh, museums and all that stuff. So they are the ones that are making sure that we're saying the right things at the right times about the right people. 
these are your guys. I want to draw your attention to the bottom one, though. Dale Barnett <coughs> is the Mills County, that's where Gulfway is, Mills County Archaeological Steward. He is also a member of our board of directors. So we have a direct link into that. Why does archaeology have anything to do with uh, plants? Well, there's a lot of reasons we study archaeology and plants at the same time. Anthropology is the study of, of cultures. Well, everybody eats. What do they eat? Plants. What do we have in our garden? We have plants that were there 3,000 years ago. What do they use for medicine? Plants. What do we still use for medicine? I mean, even the things that are you get at the, the pharmacy have plant derivatives. They may be synthetic now, but they started out as a plant. And we've got just so much. We learn so much about our plants through the archaeology that we have here. So we've got uh, several several sites that are in our area. You do have the Galt site here. It's on Buttermilk Creek. It's an amazing, really famous site. I don't know if you know that. It is really, really famous. Really famous, yeah. And um, there's also one just uh, a a little bit away from there, and I'm going to say this wrong. Is this Friedkin? Did I say it right? <gasps> Friedkin. Friedkin side is also on Buttermilk Creek. And then you have uh, the Will, uh, Wilson Leonard site, which is also is just here in Williamson County. Then we have Clovis sites. We, are, we have Clovis sites in Mills County, and that's at that Del Barnett ranch we talked about. Then we have, and you see the, the years there, and we have archaic, which is just recent. But guys, these are our, these are our sites in Mills County. Flint napping. Anyone know anything about flint napping? Yeah, yeah. So it's really cool. They take a, um, a piece of chert or flint, they get it out of a creek or out of a ledge and they take a big old rock and go whack and they cut off a big chunk of it and then they whittle that chunk down with an antler and then when it's time to fine tune it and get it sharp, they use an antler tine. So if you see right here, there's a piece of leather that's being held there because that sucker's sharp. I mean, it's sharp, sharp. Um, and then you end up with a a projectile point and I know that this is not exactly what you're getting for but trust me on this all right we have uh, all kinds of tools here now what would you what would you need a digging stick for or a hafted axe or netting or projectile points or any of those things hunting and gathering, hunting and, gathering. and that is who we're talking about is the hunters and the gatherers They also had weapons. In order to kill deer, you have to have some kind of weapon. So you have uh, the spears and spear tips, you have knives, you have uh, slingshots, and that's not just for, well, they warred with each other too, but those were for killing, not just hunting. There we go. Okay. Bows and arrows did not come onto the picture until about 700 years ago. So it was a lot of other, of other things. So they had these really long spears with the great big spear tips like this. And then they had a stick that had a little hook on one end and a handle on the other. And it's called an atlatl. And what they would do is they'd, they'd take those spears and they would hollow out part of the end of it, put it in that little hook and just throw the dickens out of it. The extra length of the addle addle gave more speed and more power and more force to that spear than just throwing it. It also helped with accuracy because the out the spear is going to leave at a certain point in that arch. That's it's just what it's going to do. If you're throwing the spear, me, I would throw it and it would go right there. But the addle addle is going to go far, and that was used far longer than the bow and arrow. Food. Here we come to the ethnobotany. 
Ethnobotany is a study of three separate disciplines. We have archaeology with botany, and then we have anthropology. So basically, it's what plants were available to the people and how they used them. So on this particular slide, we have lots of food things. We have a couple of, of uh, and don't laugh at the bullfrog. People eat frog legs still. <laughs> Those are not plants. And cicadas, we've learned that, that uh, insects are almost pure protein. They're kind of crunchy and, in my opinion, a bit gross, but uh, pure protein. And they these hunter-gatherers consider rattlesnake, at least the way that we understand it, uh, to be a delicacy. But if you look at their diet there, that's a pretty healthy diet. Bedrock mortars and matates and monos are archaeological artifacts that tell us what they ate, how they prepared it. So a bedrock mortar, we'll see some in a minute, but this, this right over here is a matate. Bedrock mortar has, uh, it's a piece of large rock that has a hole in it. It can be six to inches to a foot deep, and they take a pestle, some mortar, and pestle, and that's a um, pounding action to break up thick things. You wouldn't put a mushroom in there, right? You would put dried mesquite beans and maybe pecans and acorns, and those are things that they did. And they break things down either into a powder or a meal. And uh, then if they needed to, they'd take it over to a matate, which is this round stone that could be very slick and polished in the middle, and a mono, which is a, another kind of rock, and they just grind it until it was either paste or powder. So way back when, these guys had fine flour. It wasn't wheat, but it could be mesquite bean. It could be mesquite pod. It could be uh, any kind of nut. They had walnuts and everything. Things had to be fixed, too. So what they would do is they would have either, they would either boil, smoke, dry, or bake. And this is the way that they baked. They had earth ovens. They dig a hole. Well, I'll show you. It's easier to do it on this one. Here we go. Right here. They would dig a hole. They'd, oh, oh, let's try that again. Go back, go back. There we go. Uh, they would dig a hole. They'd start a fire in the bottom of the hole. When the fire burned down to coals, they'd put rocks on top of that. And then they would wet down either grass or prickly pear paddle, usually prickly pear paddle, especially in our area, right? And put that down on top of the hot rocks. At that point, they had a choice of whatever they wanted to put in it. What do they want to bake? What's shown in the, uh, the gardens is a sculpture of a, a split Earth oven, so you can see inside there's so tall hearts. But they also uh, baked agave hearts. They baked wild onion. They baked hyacinth bulbs. They put them in here and leave them for about 48 hours. But what they would do is they put the, they put the food in and then put the wetted grasses on top of it and then cover it with dirt and rocks and just left it there. When it came time to... Uh, uncover everything they just pile all the rocks and everything over to the side and then you have these wonderful things to eat and they're nice and warm and they're ed they're soft enough that you can eat it can you imagine trying to take a bite of a cactus that's just raw uh -huh. they couldn't either so <laughs> they got it all good and what happened is that you had a lot of reuse of these pits and what that did is create mounds of dirt and broken charred rocks. Those rocks in the bottom that you're using to bake could only be used once. They'd have to redo those rocks because they'd be cracked and they'd be charred and they'd just be sand if they didn't replace them. So that's what they did with that. They also had shelters that they made out of plants. They had uh, young trees and they would take the grasses and weave them together and make lean-tos and ramadas, which they would throw water on to make it more tolerable 
in the, the heat of the summer. So you had some evaporative cooling there. This is a little bit of naked and alone, you know? These folks really knew, really knew what they were doing on these, but these came before uh, wiki ups and they came, which came before teepees. So these, those are the earliest types of shelter outside caves that you would find. A wiki up was made with young saplings. They would cut, cut down the young sapling, stick it in the ground, put rocks around it, bend it over, put rocks around that end, and then do that eight or nine times and make a circle, lash it together with twine or rope that they had made with fibers from things like dogbane or even milkweed. Uh, they could also use the sap of the mesquite root as an adhesive and also as a waterproofer. They use that for when they're boiling things, they do it in a basket. They didn't have pots. So how do you rock waterproof that basket? Yeah. Stomach lining of a... It absolutely could be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, those, those kind of textiles things are really hard to find because they do disintegrate real quick, as you know, in your compost heaps. So uh, they would out, they would line the outside of the wiki ups with either bundles of grass or with mats or skins, uh, anything that they could get to kind of keep the rain off. So here's your fiber and basketry. They made sandals out of like bear grass or switchgrass. And they had one of the cool things that they could do is take a yucca point and break it off and peel down one side, needle and thread. <laughs> so if you're ever out in the forest and you need, you know what to do now. And who doesn't need a purse? Everybody's got to have a bag of some kind. You guys have, you know, you carry your bags in your pants, right? You got pockets too. So we have lots and lots of really cool stuff that they, that they could do. They were also, uh, there were also healers in this. Uh, now I'm going to, I'm going to show you these. These are mostly things, as you know, the wavy leaf thistle has bloomed and is now going to seed. At least it is in our area. And the prickly poppy is very, very full bloom right now in our area. We do have gay feathers and aromatic sumac, which is in full berry right now too. And the white sage, uh, the artemisia. These are all used for healing, comfort. I mean, they couldn't cure cancer or anything, but they could they could help you if you had a, a I'll give you an example, toothache. My husband, and this is a personal story, my husband is a, a patchy. He's half patchy. He comes from a long line of medicine women. I met his grandmother, and she couldn't speak English, but she was this big and about that big around. She's the tiniest human I've ever seen. And she had a, an herb garden in her backyard. Now, this is in Agua Prieta, which is in Mexico, just south of Douglas, Arizona. She had that thing gated and guarded with Ocotilla. Oh. <laughs> I, and I'm not, and I, you understand what I'm saying? They weren't like spaced apart. They were like gnarled together. I don't, oh, it was terrifying. I couldn't go anywhere close to it. And my husband said the worst trouble he ever got in was when he broke into that herb garden. <laughs> He also told me that he had uh, an abscess tooth one time. I mean, his little jaw was swollen. He's probably seven years old. His jaw was swelling up. It hurt so bad. He's running a fever. His grandmother mixed a bunch of really stinky stuff and made a poultice, put it on his face, wrapped it around his head, you know, with the bow on top. And he went to sleep. And when he woke up, the swelling was gone. The pain was gone. I want to know what she did, <laughs> but uh, it was, she was the healer for their community. She was the doctor because there wasn't anybody else. And that's, that's what we had here. So these are, these were used for home remedies. And by the way, 
this information that we have about the plants and the medicinal uses, which there's a whole nother presentation on that. We don't have time for that tonight. Or was given to us by the Comanche tribe, the Comanche Nation of Oklahoma. Um, we have a partnership with them also in that they, we get information and they say, yes, this is right or no, this is not right. And they gave us the information. So the medicine, we've already talked about that. They can make teas and like I said, poultices. They could, they could help with broken bones if they weren't too bad. But all of those were, I mean, that's all plant-based. These were nomadic people and they went from place to place to um, follow the crops, follow the, the herds. And I'm gonna tell you one more real quick little story. I'm doing pretty good. I'm trying to talk real fast. <laughs> I have an uncle, had an uncle, who had a ranch out on the Colorado River. He was finding an extraordinary number of projectile points and flakes and cores and even axes. And so he started telling folks and Purdue University got hold of it. And they came down and they did some ground, pre ground penetrating radar and some digs there. And they found a massive compound of hearths and, you know, just fireplaces and burned rock middens, the, the earth ovens. They found uh, points and partial points of every possible size and use from the big, from the big ones. You know what I'm talking about? Like Clovis points to little tiny, they call them bird points. They weren't for birds. They put poison on those. All they had to do is nick you. They found so many things, but one thing that they found that I thought was particularly interesting was a gigantic pile of mussel shells. Yeah. Yeah. So we know we, we know they ate mussels. So they were like foodies, right? <laughs> But they followed, all of those things had seasons. Now, I told you that uh, I would show you some things um, earlier. So right now I'm going to show you this. These are bedrock mortars. And if you look at this one right here, you can see the letter A called, carved in it. You can see uh, all kinds of graffiti over here on this. Vandalism is... It affects everything. These particular rocks, uh, the, the bedrocks, if you are uh, familiar with Texas Country Reporter, okay, you know the big swinging bridge at the beginning? That's in Mills County. That's uh, the Regency Swinging Bridge. And it connects Mills County to San Saba County. And this is just at the end of the bridge on San, San, the San Saba side. So you've been there? Mm -hmm. So you know why you've seen them. Yeah. Yeah. But if you look at the holes there, that is the uh, mortar. And they're not small. They're not small at all. Um, show you this. These are six mortars that we have in our gardens that were rescued. You can see several of them are cracked. So we, um, we, they were donated to us because they were damaged or they were in the way when somebody was plowing a field or somebody was building a road and they were there and they, or, and the worst one is somebody used them, found it out by the river, brought it up by the, the gate, thought that would be a good, <laughs> thought that would be a good decoration. But you can see that they do have damage. You can see one right here that's partial. <coughs> we have one of the uh, sites that's in Mills County is called the Hicks, uh, mortar bedrock mortar site because that's all he's got there are 85 bedrock mortars all of different depths on the same big rock it's just, it's pretty amazing and at the in the bottom of those i mean they've been scraped and they found the mesquite beans and they found the pecans and they found the acorns it's it's and walnuts black walnuts too but these are in our garden and it offers our, our folks a, an opportunity to see them up close, to touch them, to stand on them, to dig the leaves out of them and uh, without having to go to a ranch or go by the river. 
So the burned rock, burned rock middens is not something I talked about, but remember when I was talking about the uh, earth ovens and how they would pile the rocks? That's called a burned rock midden. And they would have huge, huge piles of rock and dirt, broken, burnt rock. It's called a burned rock midden. We do have one in our, our uh, I know you really can't tell anything about that, right? That's just covered in blue bonnet seeds. It was gorgeous earlier this year. But you can see right in here, you can see a couple of, of broken rocks. It really is about this tall and kind of like that. It's, it's humongous. It was looted and damaged uh, on the Hicks Ranch. And they dug it up. We had archaeologists come in and rehab it. And now it's an installation in the gardens as well. So we invite you to come and see these things. Uh, very quickly, we uh, partnered with the Smithsonian in, uh, Museum, Native, Native American Museum, uh, with a consultation for how to put the wiki up, which way it should face, um, why, why we're putting this here, why we're doing this this way. They helped us with our signage, with the artwork, with the, the facts, and then Historical Commission came in and, and checked those two. Um, Meadows Foundation was a big grant to help us build the gardens as well. More of our partners. I want to draw your attention to Jan Fisher, the fifth one on there. This was all her idea. All of it. The block that we have our facility on right now used to have an asbestos filled abandoned hotel, a really ugly gas station, and about five ramshackle tumble down houses. Oh, and enough carport, car parts to make about two cars which are currently buried somewhere in our gardens. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So um, we did also partner with Texan by Nature. Texan by Nature was just getting their feet on the ground when we were just getting our feet on the ground. So they had a lot of influence. Our project was one of their first pet projects. So Laura Bush came and opened um, I did the grand opening for us. This is our 10th anniversary of the gardens being open. Please come by and see them. We are just so excited that you've invited me to go. And I know that this is not your normal, um, this is not your normal program, but I do appreciate you coming. And I do want to get you home before you have a uh, hail damage on your cars out there. Do you have any questions for me? Yes, ma'am. What's a good age to bring kiddos? I know that it's a two-year-old. We have we have little. We have a lot of like hands-on stuff. I have a three-year-old, so I want to just want to make sure she can like grab anything. They can touch. Yeah, but there are no stickers. There's no stickers. Uh, kids that we have come into gardens, and we do have a children's area where we're we're looking to expand that one at another time. But uh, there's there's a sandbox for kids to play in. There's picnic tables out there. The only thing we ask is please don't let them climb on the rock walls or swim in the stream. <laughs> there there are fish there. They're little perch. They're cute. Anything? Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Is that your email? That is my email. Yeah, these are my. This is my contact. I will tell you that this is our office phone, and I. I'm part-timer. I'm retired. I don't need to do a full-time job, right? So I'm a part-timer. I'm there in the mornings. If you need to call and leave a message, that's that's awesome. But it's really probably better to just contact me either through the website or on um, on email. Any other questions? We do have a lot of garden clubs and master gardener ceremonies that happen in our gardens. They're not big gardens, but they're really interesting, really interesting. We offer guided tours, doesn't cost anything. They're open nine to four every day. Another question. Question, yes. Yeah, yeah musical concert. 
Uh -huh. um, actually, yeah, we do. Uh, part of our gardens is a uh, venue. It's the, the Gold Plate Pavilion. It can hold about 300 people. Um, we have, at least that's how many we have chairs for. <laughs> um, if we have tables involved, we can hold about 250. And our, at our goat cook-off the last Saturday in uh, April, we had a big major concert. And we held that in the pavilion and folks got to come in and see that there. So yes, yes, we do. Sorry, did you say goat? Yes. <laughs> yes, I did. Yes, I did. And I did it with my absolute best worst uh, rural Texas accent. <laughs> yeah, it's that uh, Mills County is the goat capital of the world. Not even kidding about that. There's nothing else that will grow there besides native plants. <laughs> not, not entirely true. Okay. If you have anything else, come see me. Thank you. So much. Okay, so I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Don't go away. Susan, don't go away. We need you after I sign off. So for everybody online, thanks for uh, joining us and we'll see you next month. Okay, bye.